as they are, I don't know, what would you call it, de-staging, <laughs> um, we had a great board retreat. We had a total on the first night of, of spouses and board members and, and some guests that were there a part of our, our retreat, about 30 that first night. And uh, we got to hear from Corey. Uh, I don't know if you were here when he preached one Sunday morning for us. He's planting our Wesleyan church uh, in Portland. And so I had him come and, s and share with us the first, the first night on the opening, opening of, of our retreat. But God met with us. It was a wonderful time. I think the, the expectation was, was this when we walked away from it, is we just can't wait to see what God has in store for us. There's, an, there's a sense of anticipation this morning, and uh, I am indeed looking forward to it. Thank you, board members. You have a lot to be proud of as a church, that God has brought together a great board that's going to be, we belong, we belong in Salem. We belong in the body of Christ, and God's going to be doing some great stuff and in the greater area. What I'm going to do is we're going to be uh, continuing on the Sermon on the Mount. But what I'd like to do is um, let's read the text, and I'm going to jump back into it. Um, let me again set the stage very briefly. Jesus is talking to his... Let me back up a little bit. Jesus is speaking basically to all of Israel. We read the text about how he was in Galilee and performed miracles and how he brought people from all, Jerusalem, Judea, and uh, Tyre and Sidon and the ten cities and, and the, the, to the east of the Jordan. I mean, and just all over people came. There's probably thousands of people that Jesus is speaking to in the Sermon on the Mount. And we went through the Beatitudes that last week, but I want us to understand the context of when we read this. The context is he's speaking to the people of Israel. He goes up on a mountainside, he sits down, his disciples come to him, and he begins to teach them. I think we need to understand this morning he's speaking to Israel. He's not speaking to anyone else. He's speaking to Israel. He's moving Israel from a, a, a nationalistic mentality to a theocracy, to a kingdom that is his. Don't make the mistake when you read the Sermon on the Mount and try to apply it to a government. He's moving away from that mindset, and he's applying it to his kingdom and how his people need to act and what his people are going to do moving forward. Now, we just finished the Sermon on the Mount. Now let's read. If I had my glass, I got them. There we go. 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise or glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, and let, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything has been accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, 
will be in danger of hell, of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and reconcile to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do not do it while you are with him on the way. And he, or he will hand you over to the judge and the judge will hand you over to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, there's a lot there. That is a huge, there's, there's a lot here and I'm not gonna be able to, of course, necessarily go verse by verse and explain every detail. But what I wanna do is to get the big picture of this. Now notice when, when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. I want us to understand this, is that Jesus is making an illustration of purpose, not of chemistry. Jesus is not using an illustration of chemistry to prove his point. Jesus uses, is using an illustration from purpose. So if you understand sodium chloride, you, it doesn't lose its savor in the sense that maybe us in Western culture want to think about it. What Jesus is saying is to the Israelite people, if or that you are the salt of the earth, and if you lose your purpose, you're worthless. You're not good for anything. And so the Israelite nation, he's saying to Israel, he's saying to them, listen, if you want to be this nationalistic theocracy and you think that you're going to, to just fight against Rome and you think I'm going to come and deliver you in a physical way, you have missed the purpose of why you are here. You are here because I, a long time ago, we called, I called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to this promised land for me to arrive. Jesus is the promise. He is the fulfillment, and we're going to be getting to that. He's the purpose of why Israel even existed. So if you want to keep your savor, if you want to keep the purpose of why I put you here is you need to follow me into my kingdom because that's the reason why you are who you are if you want to stay that way if you want to if you want to go over here and you want to remain paul deals with this and it's rather interesting and paul in romans chapter 9 10 and 11 he deals with, he talks about Israel, he talks about what is a true Israelite, and then he gets to 11, he, he, talk, he, he talks to them about, he, he illustrates for them that of Israel is an olive tree. Basically, the olive tree has a purpose, and it's God's purpose. And if you want to do your own thing, and you don't want to follow me, Jesus is saying, you're going to be broken off from Israel. You're going to be separated from Israel because I and my kingdom, I love what we, what we sang this morning, that Christ is the, he reigns. He is reigning right now in his kingdom and that's you and me and the people that follow him. If you don't follow him, you lose your savor. You lose the very purpose of why you are made and that illustrates then into the next point that Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. What would that say to the Jewish people of their day? Oh, wow, a city on a hill. I know exactly what that city is. It's Jerusalem. It's, it's the capital of their nation. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do you light a lamp and put it under its bowl. Instead, you put it on its stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. What is the purpose of that light? The purpose of Israel, the purpose of God's people, the purpose of his kingdom is to follow Jesus into his kingdom and go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's the purpose of why Jesus came. He is the promised one. He is the one that we are to follow. Let me illustrate it like this. <laughs> I, 
I questioned whether I should use this illustration, but you know me. I'll just go ahead and do it. At youth camp, they had a policy when I was in, when I was in youth camp just a few years ago, and I, you know, <laughs> at least right here, you know. Anyway, well, maybe not now that I get into the illustration, but they had a place was designated where youth were to be, and the designation was in lighted areas. So no smooching, all right? So if you're going to be, you know, with your boyfriend or with your girlfriend, you are to stay in a lighted area because that was the purpose of the light for the night was to protect us and to keep us honest. No smooching. You're to be in light, in a lighted area. Well, we're rather clever teenagers. And so we, I'm not kidding you, we went out into this, this, I don't know what you call it, forest, clump of trees, whatever, way out in the middle of nowhere. And there was a crazy light. I am not kidding you, out in the middle of nowhere. Are you getting it? And so we got to go out and we didn't break the rules. We were in a lighted area, smooching. <laughs> but you need to understand something, that that light was not created for that purpose. That light became absolutely worthless. You know what I'm saying? It lost its meaning, it lost its purpose. That's what Jesus is saying here about the salt and about the light. If I created this light, this is kind of bright, isn't it? Parker, you know, it's Jill's going. You should see that look right now on her face. No, because <laughs> <laughs> if I created this light to read God's word, and that's the reason why I made it. I, I mean, and, and if... If I was God, I'd say, okay, these photons are supposed to enlighten this text right here so I can read God's word. Well, if I take this light and do something else with it that's not, that it wasn't created for, but I used it anyway, notice that the light still is lit. It lost its purpose. It's good for nothing. What Jesus is saying to the people here, he's saying, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And if you are not shining, now I, I love, look, look, at, look at what it says. In the same way, let your light shine before people. Let it shine before mankind so that they may see your good deeds. Do you see that? It's like, I know that we kind of think that, oh, I've gone to church on Sunday morning and therefore people are going to know that I am, I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. It says, let it shine before people. I don't know how many people are outside the church right now just watching for you to go in. Wow. <laughs> Tristina. She walked into church this morning. Woo! Let your light shine before men. No! Stop! That's not what it's about. It's, an, it's not about your devotional time, although they're fantastic. But this is not going to be doing anything before the people of this world. What should we be doing? Are they seeing our good deeds? What, are they, what do they see? Did they see us making a difference on Wednesday night in a Bible study? No. Did they see us in Sunday school? No. Did they see the church on Sunday? Not necessarily. You know what makes a difference is when we live it out there. That's the beauty of God's kingdom. It has no boundaries. It has no borders. Everywhere you go is holy ground. Everywhere you go is where your witness should be. And it ought to be good deeds. I think that's important. I think it's valuable. It's where we work. It's how we live. It's what we do. 
Are we making a difference? I mean, my goodness, if we leave who we are when we walk out that door, basically what Jesus is saying, you're worthless. You there? Okay. Verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. Now, this is interesting. He says that you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. The purpose of why you are here, the purpose of my kingdom is so for us to shine. And then he basically then walks through and goes through the law. What's the law all about? Well, it, it, I think the law is a perfect like illustration of a trail that leads to Jesus. That's the law. It's a trail that leads to Jesus. And, and if we, let's, let's go ahead. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. Here's the key part. He came to fulfill it. I tell you the truth. Unless heaven and earth, or I'm sorry, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks the least of these and com these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom. What I want to do is I want to walk through. There's about five things that I want us to look at about what dealing with the law means and is talking about. So if we can go to the next slide would be great. Now, if here, here it is. This is a, this is a great point is if you follow the, the Pharisees or the teachers of the law, you will lose your purpose. This is what Jesus is saying here. Don't follow them because they are missing who Jesus is. They fought with him most of the time. They, they even if, they, if somebody wanted to talk to him, they could kind of sneak away on the side and say, hey, let's go. So let's go to the first. Do, do, you, have, do you have that? It says the uh, covenantal law, the sacrificial. Oh, there we, there we go. The first thing, let's look at the ceremonial law. Because when you, what Jesus is talking about, he's, he's, he's putting a big picture over the law. But if you break the law down, it has a whole lot of different facets to it. First, I want to look at the ceremonial law. That law is kind of a distinguishing element for Israel. Now, it also had elements of medical procedures and stuff to follow. But basically, the ceremonial law... I mean, they have, if you read it, you, you kind of look at it and you go, oh my goodness, what in the world does that mean? You mean there's certain fabric that you can't use? Basically, you, you can't eat something like and mix it with this or that, or, or you can't make, mix. I mean, when I was in Israel, you couldn't order a cheeseburger. You can't mix meat and the milk. It needs to be separate. And you look at that, and, and we look at that today in Western culture mind. We think that's just kind of weird and stupid. Why in the world? Why did God do that in the Old Testament? He's telling the church, the Jesus kingdom people that he's preaching to right now, he's telling them, you know what? We need to stay separate. We are a holy people. We're going to be in the world, as, as Jesus talks about and prays for his disciples in John chapter uh, 16 and 17. And, and he says, we are to be in the world, but not of the world and so that separation that ceremony but Jesus Christ fulfilled that he is the fulfillment of that law the sacrificial system is kind of obvious I think we understand that we, we see that the sacrificial system in the Old Testament they would sacrifice animals that were a picture of Jesus to come we, once Jesus came, do we still sacrifice animals? No. Jesus is the final sacrifice. You know what's interesting today when we deal with the sacrificial system? A lot of people in our culture today, we are so far removed from Old Testament understanding. And, and we are so, f and then we talk about Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. We, it, it's, it's so confusing to people. Let me, let me briefly illustrate this, and, and I, I hope this makes some sense. I'm going to give two illustrations. One is, why in the world did God require sacrifices of animals in the Old Testament? Why did he do that? 
I mean, some people would raise their hand and say, well, that's animal cruelty. So why would he, why would he do that? You know what's interesting? We don't have a problem today at all with animals being sacrificed so that you can eat, right? I mean, in, unless you're a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, you're so cute. I'm picking on you today, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like most, most people understand that. And by the way, in the Old Testament, when they sacrificed an animal, almost all of the animal was used for food for the priest. The other element, too, is in the medical community, you know that a lot of the, the let me bring this up. I just, penicillin, blood transfusions, tuberculosis, uh, macular degeneration, asthma, kidney transplants, breast cancer, and I can go on insulin, all are results of animal sacrifices that gave, the animals gave their lives so that humanity, so that we could live. Isn't that interesting? Medical science is, is going on today that helps preserve the human life. And you say, why did God do that? Because we sinned. We have done right. <laughs> Let me ask you, anybody in here never did anything wrong? We've all been there, right? We've all done something wrong. Well, because sin separates us from God, there's a broken relationship. And where there's a broken relationship, we die. It's not like, oh, I can break a relationship with God and I'm okay. I can sustain myself. I can sustain my life. No, you can't. He's the source of life. He's the very essence of life. He keeps us alive. And for since Adam all the way till Christ, that sacrifice is the seriousness of, of what our sin did in breaking that relationship with God. It's kind of like if, if I had a relation, in other words, if, if there was a light bulb up here and I plugged it in and that, that source, that electricity uh, uh, plugged into the wall was the reason why that, <coughs> that light could be illuminated. As soon as you walk away and pull and unplug it, the light bulb goes out. Its source is disconnected. So when we sin, we've broken that relationship and that fellowship with God. And he says, and he said to us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But hang on. He was going to come in the fullness of time. And when Jesus Christ, between the time of our fall and the time, the fullness of time when Jesus came, there was this animal sacrifice to show us the seriousness of what sin is. Let me illustrate it like this. He could have just said, oh, I'm sorry, humanity. You broke relationship with me. You broke fellowship with me. You're done. But he didn't. He preserved us. Through, these, through the seriousness that where we, we deserve to die, instead God allows an animal to die in our place as a temporary fix. Listen to this. Let me illustrate. Let me get it really practical and personal. I had, I had an aunt and uncle that lived on a, a, a kind of a lot of property out in the, out in the sandy area. And, um, <coughs> and, and they lived on a road, that would, and on the road, it, it kind of bent. And in, in that bend in the road, you really could not play in. Because if they came home and they turned that corner, they could hit you. They could kill you. And so there's kind of a rule there that, you just don't play there. Let me give this illustration. Say that there was a, a little boy and his dog that were playing in that place in the bend in the road where you shouldn't be playing. And dad comes home. Dad turns that corner. Something's going to happen, and it's not going to be good. He either has the choice of taking out his son or taking out the dog. What did God do? He took out something that was near and dear to the family. He spared humanity. That's a picture of the Old Testament. 
But now that Jesus has come, he's fulfilled it. He's the one that was put in our place. Jesus Christ fulfilled that. And so now you have the fulfillment of Jesus. We don't offer sacrifices anymore. We have the forgiveness of sin. The next one is the moral law. God's holiness, his moral law, in that sense, doesn't change. It's fulfilled in Christ in the sense that we haven't kept it, but Christ did. He was the perfect one. The next one is the covenantal law. That's the law in which the covenant that was made with Abraham and the promise of that covenant is Jesus. And the new covenant that Jesus established is what we experience today. And then we have the governmental law, how he governed and managed the nation of Israel. Well, Jesus is our king. He is the one in whom we follow. And it's his, his, it is in his kingdom that we reside. Now let's go on to the next thing, and that is dealing with hatred and murder. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Now, let me stop right there. What's interesting is what Jesus is doing, he is walking through this issue of anger and what it leads to. You see, what anger does and what the body of Christ and what we do today in his kingdom, how we act and how we interact is of the utmost importance because it makes a difference in what the world sees. If you look at anger, Jesus makes a progressive argument here. He says, he talks about anger first and then he goes to raka. Raka means empty head. It means basically you're stupid. In other words, if you have a problem, so if somebody sets you off, if you're angry, what happens is that leads then to another level of looking at that person in less than a way that God wants us to. And that is, we look at that person as, oh, they're empty. They're without argument. I'm the one that's right. And I'm, we puff ourselves up. That person is empty and is stupid. Look at the next level. The next level, he says, you fool. Now, this has lost most of its impact in our culture today because of, you know, the A-team and Mr. T and pity the fool. Anyway, that's old stuff there. <laughs> Somebody's sitting there going, I have no idea what he's talking about. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. The word fool here basically means godless. It means empty and void of God's image within that other person. So you see the progression. Progression. I'm not only angry with you, but I think that you are stupid. I think that you got an empty argument. You're not worth it. And not only that, but you're godless. You don't even know God. I, I think that your behavior and what you've done, it, you don't even have any, you don't even know God. You see what's happening here? Look at the progression. And Jesus says, you know what it starts with? It starts with anger. That progression is not healthy for you or me. Now look what he says. It, it says, you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, let me understand, let, let us understand this. First of all, that word hell there is Gehenna. It's, it, it's a valley, Gehenna is a valley in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, again, Jesus set this picture, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. See this picture that Jesus is painting? A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And then he gets to the place where Gehenna is south of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is sitting on a hill. And then you have Gehenna is in the, if you look on a map, it would be in the southwest corner. And um, it's a valley that they threw all the garbage in. In other words, does this kind of sound familiar? In other words, this is where they would go and cast all their garbage that has no purpose. Again, get that? No purpose, no meaning, no value of what it's for. In other words, if you are hating your brother, you're angry with your brother, and then you say that they're basically godless, 
What Jesus is saying is, you then become, you lose the purpose of why I created you. You lose the purpose of why I've made you, and that is to go on into all the world and preach the gospel. You've lost the value and the purpose of why I made you. And basically, what is it good for? It's good, it's just to be thrown to the side, cast in the garbage, where the fire just burned continually in Gehenna. Isn't that interesting? So when we look at that, we kind of look at it, you know, like, oh, some hellfire and brimstone preacher, you know, Bob, you're going to go to hell. No, if you look at the real picture of it, it's no, you're, you've lost your purpose and your value and, and basically to be tossed out and burned. In other words, it's like underneath this, the light in the middle of the forest, <laughs> the light lost its purpose. So if we lose our purpose in our anger and how we deal with people, how should we handle it? Therefore, again, when you see the word therefore, you have to ask the question, what's it there for? And you look above, and we just talked about that. So therefore, if you have an offer, offer your gift at the altar, you need to leave it there. If you know you have a problem with somebody. Now, th keep in mind, Jesus is speaking this message in Galilee that's north of Jerusalem. And people would travel all over to offer their offerings at the temple in Jerusalem. They'd bring their offering. Oftentimes they would work, they would gather up their money, and they would head south to Jerusalem. And they would get to Jerusalem, they would go into the temple area, and they would either buy their, their offering or their sacrifice, whether it be dove, pigeons, or uh, they would bring it with them, and they would present it into the temple to the priest. And he, Jesus says, by the way, after you get all the way there, after you've done all that work, I want you to leave your gift at the altar. If you've got a problem with somebody, I want you to leave. In other words, Jesus is saying, I don't want your worship. That's, you, you can't worship me until you go get this settled. Isn't that interesting? You can go to the next point there, Evelyn, where basically I break it down to... Um, you have to make it right. It's your responsibility. You leave your gift. You leave your worship. And you go. It's your effort. And you be reconciled. You're the one that has to change. Isn't that interesting? The word reconciliation means basically this. It's a change of mind. It's a change of mind. Does that mean the, the situation that you're involved with or, or you feel or you've been offended? I'm telling you, yeah, I, I get it. The issue is how are you going to handle that? Are you going to go to your brother? Are you going to talk to them? Are you going to say, hey, you know what? You know, this, is, this just blows my mind. As long as I've been in ministry, I don't think I have. It's been very seldom whether two people who have a problem is really a problem at all. Mostly it's a misunderstanding. Mostly they come from two completely different perspectives in life and one interprets the other differently. It's interesting how Jesus is saying, listen, don't get angry. Leave your gift. It's your responsibility. Go talk to them. That's why I think it's beautiful in the body of, in, in, and, and I love, what I love about this church is I love how you get along. I love how you interact. I love how people go to each other if they've concerned or they've said something and they say, let me explain this to me. Help me out here. You see, that's what matters. Jesus said, if my people are going to make a difference, how, how, how are we going to make that difference in the world if we can't get along here, right? We're going to love each other. And then Jesus go on, goes on to say, do it quickly, by the way. And then he gives a descriptive, not necessarily a prescriptive, he gives a description of what in their culture it was like to continue walking through this. And, and if you do, it, the outcome may be very bad if you don't resolve these conflicts. It's only just starting. I love the Sermon on the Mount. This is so good. Every head bowed and every eye closed. The very purpose and the value of why you are made and, the why you, and why you are created is for you to be salt and light in the world that we live. The very purpose you are made 
God has made you to make a difference in this world. God has made you for his kingdom. God has made you to serve in his kingdom. God has made you to function in his kingdom. If you feel like this morning there's a, a purpose is missing, that purpose is found in Jesus' kingdom. Is there any here this morning who would like to say, Pastor Dane, pray for me. There's just, you can just raise your hand and say, pray for me this week. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you. I will pray for you to find that purpose. Thank you and that value. Dear Lord, as we close, as we close this morning, may we truly, truly realize just that, that you are our king, that we are in your kingdom.